Hey. <laughs> We're back again. Great. <laughs> oh, you're two days off. Uh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How's it going for you all? Oh, doing good. Yeah. Doing good. How's the uh, split class format? It's going, going surprisingly <laughs> well for how many balls are kind of being juggled. Right. What do you, what do you guys think? <laughs> If, if it's sketchy at best. Right. It's got to be nice having more studio space, though. It is. Like yeah. Spread out where it could get bigger immediately. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Being able to spread it out a little bit has uh, been nice. Yeah. That's great. So you're not teaching this semester? No, not this year. I didn't teach last year. Uh, I moved back. Not last summer, the summer before. So I with I uh, actually resigned my job out at Linfield College out in uh, Oregon the spring of nineteen. Gotcha. Yeah. 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 And then moved back to Michigan. Nice. Yeah, kind of a uh, a bit of a circus there. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, that's it. I don't want to be part of your circus anymore. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It actually. I would actually be tenured right now if I stayed. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, but I was like, you got to follow what you think you should be doing. Yeah. Regardless. Yeah. Yeah. Well, kudos. Right. Something else will sort itself out. Yeah. Today's a good day. Yep. Yeah. Well, we uh, we got everybody in their seats. Okay. Um, so uh, take take it away as you like. I have to, uh, do you have the screen share going? Yep, I got a, there we go. It should be, yes. Ready to rock. You can see it? Yep, we're on that PowerPoint again. So what, do you see? So you share, you see just my PowerPoint? I see just the PowerPoint right now, yeah. Is it, do you see the, the slides off to the left? I yeah. do, yeah. Right, so, okay, all right. So now you see a grid? Yeah. Right, I'm trying to go, I think there's presenter mode. Instead of using my whole screen to, Right. Yeah. I don't know where that's at. I think it's under slideshow. Oh. It's slideshow. Right. Presenter. Oh, there it oh, that's wild. I just have a big red square. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyways. Um, Here, we'll get out of that, go back to what we did on Tuesday. Sure. Let me, I'm getting the wheel of death right now, so. Oh, sure. Yeah, take your time. Okay. All right. There, there. That one. There, working? Yep. Awesome. Okay, let me change one thing here. So I actually look like I'm talking to the classroom instead of uh, over here, bottom to the left, and then slides. So great. Okay, hey everybody. Um, I don't know what the weather like is where you are, but it's dreary rain. Uh, it feels like November here in uh, Metro Detroit, Southern yeah. Michigan. Um, as Zach's probably told you, my name is Scott Ross. Uh, I'm a sculptor, uh, educator, builder. Um, I'm going to do a talk today and talk you through what you're going to see is after the initial preview of some kind of where I started, 
uh, in my creative pursuits, uh, schooling wise, then it'll segue into work I've made in the last 10 years. Um, I went to undergraduate, I'll give you a little background. I went to undergraduate at Eckerd College in St. Petersburg, Florida, uh, graduated in 97. And then I built houses for 12 years in Michigan um, and then went to graduate school in 2009 to 2012 at Southern Illinois University Edwardsville, which is just across the river from St. Louis, Missouri, if you're familiar with that down that river way. And then went straight from there, taught for four years at Kentucky State University, and then taught for three years after that, uh, from 2016 to 19 at a school out in Oregon, um, Linfield College. And as I was saying to Zach at the beginning here, I resigned from there last spring, um, 2019 spring, this year doesn't count. This, this year has an asterisk uh, in terms of everything or in regard to everything. Um, right. And uh, so I've been pursuing, I resigned there to build my creative network in a very, uh, as fast as I could, uh, researching and all of that. I'm sure Zach could share with you at times about what it takes about residencies and making contacts and building a network and reaching out to people and doing all that and not being, don't be hesitant about it. Um, it was one of the faults I had actually was that I built my own kiln and built my own studio wood kiln here at my house. And I never did any residencies because I didn't really understand why you'd go do that if I had everything here. Um, fast forward is that I learned that I built no creative network. I was working in a bubble on an island. And so building connections and then leveraging those and being for opportunities, whether you're invited or you've submitted for it, um, was slow coming to me because I didn't understand. I wasn't mentored into that at all. Um, and then by the time I got to grad school, it's been full on, you know, teaching and making um, since then. So it's been a, a respite of a year to focus on mostly my studio work, which has been great. So I'll just give you a little background about me. Um, oh. Yeah, so there we go. Okay, um, so my, I started out as creative writing major at Eckerd when I was an undergraduate. Uh, this guy's name is Lawrence Ferlinghetti. Uh, if you're familiar with the Beat Poets, uh, Jack Kerouac, G Allen Ginsberg, Gregory Corso, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, uh, they were they came about right before the hippies. And in terms of time, times had a culture time uh, in America. And Lawrence Ferlinghetti owned the City Lights bookstore, who published a lot of Kerouac and early Corso and and himself, of course, and a little bit of Burroughs, but he was more like the senior member, William S. Burroughs. Um, and so this is the writers that I studied. Well, this was my entrance into visual arts, more or less. Lawrence Ferlinghetti was very close friends with Franz Klein, which is a, a classic abstract expressionist. Um, and Franz Klein and William, William de Kooning were best of friends for a very, very long time uh, and until Franz Klein's death. And then so my entrance into visual art was two-dimensional, was large abstract paintings, uh, being a builder for a number of years. And I was always, as a kid, I was always constructing things, forts, half pipes, trick ramps, sculpture things. Um, I was always stacking and building. And so looking back, I see that these painters had, I had an affinity to them because of their constructed qualities and, and aesthetic in some of their works. Now, abstract expressionism when painting goes back to Jackson Pollock. So all roads kind of lead to Jackson Pollock and then away from Jackson Pollock. It's a real seminal painter uh, force in the two dimensional world. But it was about the action of painting, which <clears throat> for me made a lot of sense um, because being a, a very visceral reactive person uh, when I was younger and also being very physically engaged in the world as a college as an athlete as a college athlete even now with mountain biking road cycling you know working you know I'm, I understand a lot of things I understand things more through working than I do through contemplation 
you know, I've tried to get both of those to work, um, to synthesize to one another. So being present in physical activity. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later. It'll become self-evident. And I talk about Zen Buddhism and a little bit of sitting practice I do. But so kind of you, you getting these things to work together instead of feeling like they're disparate experiences. But a little background. So Peter Volkus was a, uh, an American well-established successful potter at the beginning of his career. And he brought the qualities. He was also hung out in New York City at the Cedar Bar and met Franz Klein, met Willem de Kooning. He was a very young man at the time. And he took and kind of aped the conventions of abstract expressionism, the activity of it, the physicality of it, and brought that into ceramics, which was mostly a craft. Either it was a figure or it was a vessel. That's the history of ceramics. Um, and he disposed of both of those while also still referencing them and really in a very visual way began to deconstruct those traditions um, and brought abstract expressionism into the material of clay. He also did a lot of bronze, did huge public work, but this is what Volkus is mostly known for. Uh, also did a lot of monotypes. Um, and ink drawing is just kind of gesture moments that were registered on two two dimensional planes. But if you've done collage work and monotypes, it's a construction, even though itself is very, very, very thin. Um, Peter Volkus's first student uh, was at the Otis Art Institute. He was hired at Otis to build a ceramics program. And if you look at Peter Volkus's kind of like instructional tree, um, you'll see some of the heaviest hitters ever in the ceramic field and beyond were former students. So it comes out of, if you follow coaching at all or professional sports or collegiate sports, you'll see, you'll hear about coaching trees. In teaching, we have a similar thing. It's like, who are you mentored by? And then who did you mentor? And you find these connections that work through academia, all sorts of fields, but these are the ones I'm familiar with. Um, and so Paul Soldner was his first student. And Paul and Peter Volkus were about the same age. Um, both went to college after on the GI Bill uh, and both were in World War II. Um, so Paul Soldner was my undergraduate professor's uh, graduate professor at Scripps College. Um, at, well, the Claremont Colleges and Scripps is one of them, Claremont College, Scripps. There's Harvey Mudd. They're all in that area of Southern California in the Inland Empire area. And so my undergraduate professor's name is Brian Ransom. And that's, I wasn't taking clay at all. I was writing, I'd finished my, my thesis already. I'd written a novella, um, done spoken word performances, all this stuff. I had a free elective my senior year of my uh, undergraduate. And my friend, Nick Schwartz, who's a potter and a uh, sculptor up in Mendocino, California, asked me to take a clay class with him. He's like, can I take clay classes? Dude, Brian's cool. It's like, yeah, all right. <laughs> well, you know, it's like you have those moments where you find something and I was like, wow, this is great. And I had the dexterity for it more so than other starting students. So I had an affinity to working with my hands uh, that I was progressing rapidly in the first clay class. So <clears throat> I, uh, stayed for another senior year. I went and talked to the chair. It's a small school, 1500 students or so. And I stayed and I went and talked to the chair and I said, uh, Arthur, who, Arthur Skinner, who's still there, which is crazy. Um, Cause that was 20 years ago. Uh, said, I said, I want to get an art degree. Is that possible? He's like, uh, yeah, let's see. <laughs> so I took 13 art courses in one year and then had a solo show of work uh, in a gallery on campus. Um, and then left and came back up to Michigan. So that was in 97. Now, this is my house in Michigan, my little studio on the right. Uh, if you look behind the corner of the garage there, you can see the chimney. I built an anagama in my backyard. And if you know everything, anything about like property size, I live, I live on less than a quarter of an acre. And then my neighbors all butt, you know, their, their backyards butt into mine. And so, and where I live in an area, I don't know what your area is like around Kirkwood, but we don't have a lot of fences in my neighborhood. Like it's just yard links to yard through a neighborhood and you just kind of mow to a spot that it's agreed upon and half the year, depending 
or half the fall, depending on which way the wind blows, you're either bagging your neighbor's leaves that blow down that blew onto your yard, or if it happens to blow the right way, it's like takes all your maple leaves, puts it on JR's backyard, and then JR has to deal with them, you know. Mm. And we all help each other out, anyways. But I had this is the house, <clears throat> excuse me, that I grew up in. So I've either lived here or lived in a dorm or lived in an apartment. So it's the only home I've ever known um outside of like those rental property things that you do as a student young adult and all that then grad student later on but i came home and built a studio built a small kiln the kiln photo i'm going to show you is the current kiln i have um now since 2006 but what i did to make a living is i became a rough framer i was a carpenter and this is what i did for 12 years uh, monday through half day on with a half day on Saturday, uh, year round in Michigan. Uh, this job and that career is on par with my studio practice. Um, it says just as fulfilling of a thing. And when I got to grad graduate school, I realized kind of why, which was I was very, I was building very functional sculpture on a massive scale uh, most days of the week. And in 12 years, I probably had less than a handful of days I didn't feel like being at work. But I end up injuring myself at work. And so being a full time carpenter is not something I can do. Uh, I'm also almost 50 now. And you don't see a whole lot of older carpenters that can stand up straight. It's just it's a young person's. It's a younger person's game. Um, <clears throat> but I love this job. I love building things, making things with my hand. So this is in 06, I built the, was building the kiln. This is the third version of a wood kiln on this same little site. If you look over the top photo, the photo on the top left, if you just look back there a little closely, you can see my neighbor's deck. Like that's the corner of his deck. And then if you pan to the right, that's his pool. Um, <laughs> so we're, I'm like 30 strides, for, so I can stoke. You guys have a wood kiln you're working with. I can stoke enough wood in the firebox and go float in the pool for 30 minutes. And I can see the chimney with the flame shooting out the top. So I just watch. And when the flame flickers down out of the chimney, I got to get out of the pool, put my flip flops on, walk back over. I'm firing at home. So these safety things that you have to do at school and wear doesn't apply as much when it's your own house. And so I would stoke in, you know, a pair of gloves, a pair of shorts, and a pair of flip flops fill the firebox back up, walk back across the yard, and go back to swimming. And we just do that for half a day because we're firing for so long, 12 to 14 days. We're just building heat, and building ash. Um, so this is the kiln I use. I started out when I got back, I made pots like on a pottery mm -hmm. wheel and they're pretty tight. You know, they're, I mean, it's a, the pottery wheel is an instrument or it's a piece of equipment. It's not an end all. It's like a, a different, you know, it's a hammer. It's a screwdriver. It's a cordless saw. It's like, it's not the end all. And one of the things that held me up was that I was making work thinking about what I could sell it for. And that thinking about down the road hampered me at the current time of what I wanted to make. And it ended up being a very frustrating pursuit. Um, so I had mentioned her a few minutes ago, I had hurt myself uh, building houses. So I was laid up and I have some back surgeries and everything's fine, but I had time to reflect and that time of reflection gave me an opportunity to really think about um, weight and gesture and not being so rigid. I had to be more flexible with what I was going to do in the future. And those things led me into a lot of self-reflection as if anyone's been injured or uh, had to be, had to sit down or had to take it easy for a while while you're recouping from something. Um, if you're not filling it with constant entertainment, of like whatever the phone the tv the cable you know dvds whatever it is streaming everything now um it it provides time for self-reflection and i really started to think about what was what, what i was responsible for what was important to me um what i held in high value and so all of that led me into a buddhist zen buddhist practice of sitting meditation because I was very worried about the future and I was very concerned about my own past and neither one of those things existed. But sitting and working with your breath 
and focusing on your breath is as present as you could get. And that's really the only thing that's happening right now is what we're doing right now, kind of for an example. Everything that's gonna happen later today could or could not happen. Of course we hedge our bets and most likely everything will be fine mm -hmm. um, or be as expected. But having an acknowledgement that life is lived presently um, took me a lot of work because I was always next, next project, next thing, next, 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 and I missed out on a lot of present. So this Zen Buddhist practice, well, one of the things with Buddhism, Zen Buddhism was that at the center of things, there's nothing. There's no, like you acknowledge, there's nothing that's more important than anything else. It's not that it's a void of anything. It actually contains everything. Just there's no hierarchy between a sensation, a feeling, a memory, a thought, those sorts of things the naming of things. Nothing is no more important than anything else. Everything is transitory. Everything is fleeting. Um, and so there was a book I was reading at the time by the Dalai Lama, um, which is Tibetan Buddhism, which is a different type of Zen Buddhism or different type of Buddhism. It's like, if you know anything about Buddhism or it's like with Christianity, you have Baptists and Methodists and, and uh, Lutherans, Catholics, and they're all different, but they're kind of landing underneath that umbrella. Um, and so in this book, it was called The Universe in a Single Atom. And it was an interesting, there's a really interesting statement in there is that the Dalai Lama, who is a devout science researcher and, and uh, believer, and has gone to Harvard and MIT multiple times, all these huge institutions all over the world, and asked questions about existence and particles and matter and physics and astrophysics and all these things as a curiosity. And he said, if <clears throat> he said so far, science and Buddhism run parallel with each other. He says, if science proves Buddhism to be untrue, then Buddhism will change, which is a remarkable statement to think that this spiritual practice will adjust itself to a proof instead of grinding the proof to make it follow your belief or a belief doesn't have to be yours a belief um and so in that was this idea that the, and i mentioned this because it's he talks about subatomic particles and that the farthest they've been able to magnify and look into subatomic particles there's nothing in there there's no mass to in the subatomic particle it creates an electronic field, right? Like a magnetic field. And you get enough of those stacked together and then you have something that has mass like this cup. But way inside there in the subatomic level, there's nothing. And so that parallels Buddhism is at the center of all things, there's nothing or no thing with a little dash. So I started to look at and use negative space as a design element in my pieces, referencing this idea of no thing nothing at the center or nothing on the inside, right? And when I started to make these pieces in clay, you may be able to pick out how many people have used a pottery wheel. Yeah, so can you see in the center there, that's got like that dish element to it of this piece. Like you can see the whip, the spiral going around, right? And it's got the hole in the center. So this started, I came about this form, not this particular one, but this idea um, is that I was making large bowls, large plates. And I, of course, I everyone that's thrown has gone down too far and hit the wheel head. And then you've lost, you know, your thickness in the foot. And I thought, well, that's an opening. And so I made two of those and took one bowl and another bowl, stood them up and stuck them together and lined up the hole in the center. And I was like, I abandoned making pots because I wasn't selling very many. And this is what my interest was. So I just started making these pieces, you know, or engaged with these ideas and thus making these pieces, these pieces going back and, ref and referencing those ideas. Now, <clears throat> when you start noticing something or you're looking for something or you build the lens at which you're looking through that you see the world, I started noticing all these spaces with negative space, reference negative space, really optical, like um, um, like an aperture, not optical, aperture opening, 
uh, which is adjustable, right, from the camera. Our eyes and aperture, it dilates. Um, and so you just start noticing these things all around. Well, one of the things I noticed is that they're not as, they're irregular. And I started to think about the interior space of myself or of the self. And I thought, well, I'm probably not a perfect circle on the inside in terms of a geometric form, right? I'm like, we're all human beings, people, higher level thinking are all multifaceted on the inside is the way that I, I coined it to myself. And so I thought I should probably start working with this negative space element in a more faceted way and less front and back, like and started to work in more in three dimensions instead of having, you know, a flat plane and a flat plane connected together with an opening on the inside. And then it that really read as front and back instead of a full three dimensional object like this sculpture class So you guys are all dealing with like check it from multiple perspective perspectives don't work from just one the whole time. Now, <clears throat> I met Nino Caruso in China. He invited me. He's an Italian sculptor. Uh, this is a little more background stuff for me. Um, and he's uh, uh, passed on now a couple years last January, um, or uh, two years, January 21st, I think was the date. Nino invited me at, when he was 80 years old to be his uh, studio assistant for his life's retrospective when he was 80. And this was in 2000. Eight, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and so I went to Nino's house. I traveled to Italy, stayed with him for a month, um, and this is his country home on the left there. And I was up in the very top floor there, and then the bottom left photo is what I looked out of over his studio there to the right, and then on the porch where we had dinner every night at nine or nine thirty at night um, is the down the valley, the river that runs between where the photos taken and the hamlet out of, uh, of Todi, Italy, is the river that runs into Rome. And Rome was known as the city of water. Um, it's a, the history is quite remarkable. Um, but so that's where I was at. Well, Nino is credited with our very heavily influenced architectural ceramics. And I had understand architectural ceramics to be an applied surface, mosaics, tiles, relief that were, you know, attached to a pediment, um, those types of things. Well, Nino was really into the structure themselves, the wall, the pillar, the gate, the portico, the entrance, the path. Um, and so I kind of being construction background, I was like, wow, this is really, I'm seeing ceramics and I'm seeing architectural ceramics in a way that I didn't know existed really. Um, and so when I got back, I started making these forms and I would ram cast play, clay on the inside. Uh, so stacking these forms up and then using found objects that were near me, a lot of fire bricks, tools, split firewood, all kinds of stuff and casting that void on the inside, but using ceramics and just packing it in like where they do uh, earth architecture um, and ram earth walls. They'll build a wall that takes the topsoil off an area, take the, take the, literally clay base or underneath the topsoil, the dirt itself, and under high pressure, ram the walls. And in the desert Southwest, you have buildings that have been standing for three and 400 years, uh, but they're not Adobe construction, it's rammed earth construction. You just have to keep it dry. Um, and they'll usually put a straw in there or some kind of mix. And so I made these pillar forms, not knowing like really construction wise, but just sorting it out. Um, now I'm going to go through my a little bit of grad school here. It's not in chronological order because some of the things I started in grad school have morphed and evolved into things I'm doing now. Other things I've completely left behind. Uh, other things are dependent on budget. You know, I really think everything's a maquette based on budget. Like you build a seven foot bronze, it could be 70 feet, you know, um, but it's a totally different decimal point where it's at. And I, at the very, very end, this is like 90 slides, so I'll try to hurry up here. At the very, very end, I'll show you some maquettes that I'm working on uh, that are larger scale projects that are for public commission, if I can get them. So I'm in graduate school, and I'm looking at kind of the structure of things. Uh, I build houses, so houses are stacked like a birthday cake. You have your foundational elements, you have your interior spaces, you have your above spaces, and then you have your attic space. Well, 
not until I started writing my thesis that I realized I had been working vertically through a house over my three years of graduate school. Didn't plan on it. That was just a natural progression because that's also what I had done for 12 years. We start in the basement and build a home. Um, not on purpose, that would be quite visionary of me. But that wasn't the case, it was discovered. And so I'm looking at foundational elements, uh, but all the, all the things I had done had been for function. They had been functioning well and uh, in construction, but I have this in here, this is a crematorium. These columns function at, for an idea instead of function for structure, like practical function. Like a header over a doorway holds the floor up above it. So it doesn't crash into the doorway or pinch your door. These are here for the souls to follow because it's a crematorium to follow up towards the light, right? Always a heavenly reference. And so these functioned for not for an idea. And I thought, and I'm in graduate school, like, oh, architecture in the function of an idea instead of architecture in the function of design. And so I started making, casting concrete pillar forms and bringing that aperture and that opening back into the work, uh, dealing with very hard geometry, somewhat of a minimalist aesthetic, um, but a very brute aesthetic, kind of a brutalist aesthetic, uh, which comes in in some of my more recent work back in. Um, There's this truth to materiality, um, not hiding construction methods, those sorts of things. Now, I did a very formal consideration here is that the, the previous piece had all the faceting on the outside. And what I did on this piece was bring the faceting to the inside. So that pink form on the left there is the inter, inner dimension of the form on the right. So the plywood is the cast outside form. Um, and I left a hole in the top. And so the interior space when the light came, when the sun came over on a clear day would cast a light to the interior of the sculpture, bringing light into the interior, kind of referencing back again to what I had been experiencing when I first started reading and, and sitting practice in Buddhism. And lighting the interior is a little more of a Taoist philosophy. Like there's a, a um, in Taoism, they say there's a light and then there's a pile of dirt. And often people say pile of shit over top the light, your job is to remove all the shit in the dirt to reveal the light. Light's always been on. It just can't penetrate all the mess. So you got to fix the mess. Now, so I used that one column to the right, made these shorter ones. And this was a public uh, piece, minimalist aesthetic for sure, uh, from within. And it talked about adding or acknowledging, excuse me, not adding, uh, acknowledging the the city officials that approved the Granite City Sculpture Park in Illinois, it was brand new at the time. And so I set out of a site um, with that horizontal band and the vertical band between the two smaller pieces. And as you sat at the, this four-way traffic intersection, um, if when you sat, you view the first car on the right, if you looked over, you'd almost you know, be sighting right down through that. And whether you know that acknowledgement, I'm forcing the viewer to look at and peer at something. They don't know that they may or may not know it's the city offices, uh, but just as an acknowledgement through that with or within the idea for the public sculpture. Now, when talking about volume and light and utilizing light and gaze, this is a piece by James Terrell, uh, who's a light and space movement uh, uh, sculptor. And he was quantifying light into uh, form, right? Because light is just, light is a, is a reflective uh, element. So what it does is that light has to bounce off of something and then you see the color. But how do you get, how do you measure, how can you put a quantity and make a volume out of say this space that's right here? Like you can't, can't hold that, can't really grasp it. Um, and the light's traveling through it. And so James Terrell was doing a lot with casting a projection that appeared to be a solid object. And so it's playing optically with our, our, well, it's playing with our optics, which is kind of 
moving our senses, how we're actually seeing. Uh, Robert Irwin has a great book that he wrote. Uh, it's a seminal book for artists called uh, Seeing is Forgetting the Name of the Thing that You're Looking at. So if you've studied semiotics at all, or if you've heard that word before, semiotics is the study of signs and symbols. That's what art is. That's what you're doing, whether you realize it or not. Your alphabet is semiotics. Our alphabet is semiotics. A stop sign is semiotics. All information falls within semiotics. It's the sign symbols. And so you are forgetting the name of the thing that you're looking at is to finally be seeing it without naming it. Once you name something, then it falls into the naming of signs and symbols. If you can keep from naming something, then you're actually just experiencing it. Um, yeah, so anyways, it's a, it's a phenomenal book. It's a phenomenal book. Um, and it was written so well, uh, that book, and there's a biography, autobiography, excuse me, on Willem de Kooning um, that was written so well, it won the Pulitzer, it won a Pulitzer Prize for literature. And it was, and it's a massive book, it's like 400 and some pages. I had to set limits on myself that I'd only read 20 pages a day or 30 pages a day because I would have read it in a weekend. Like it's a page turner and it's a biography. <laughs> it's, just, it's that well written. Um, that's a really good one too. A um, lot of insight. So anyways, but so James Terrell, well, this is the light that I'm used to seeing quantified. I'm an avid uh, live music fan and music festivals. And if you've been to a show, obviously not this year, uh, prior to January 1st, um, you know, the light shows have become, for years now, have become another member of the band. Like it's remarkable what light engineers are doing at concerts. Like before you'd want to often sit, get as close as you could. So you could, you know, inter like not interact with the band they're playing, right? You're just cheering, but you want to get close. Now it's like, I don't want to be close. Like the whole light show happens. I don't even get to see that part. Like I want to be center in the back, like just taking the whole scene. And also sound systems got a lot better. So it still sounds really good in the back as it did in the front. But this is the light that I'm used to seeing quantified. And so I had opportunity to do an installation in this center atrium area and in dealing with construction and architecture and carpentry. And I was able to put a quantity to a light off of a fixture that stopped before these translucent panels that I built out of drafting paper. Old drafting paper was this yellow paper you could see through. And so you could check drafts one on top of the other and lay them over top to see multiple versions of something at the same time, what worked. Um, it was also a cheap paper because drafting paper, you'd have to go through it really fast. Um, and they're drafts, right? It's not finished paper, it's a draft. It's like a drawing. You know, there's drawings and there's sketches, there's drafts and then there's finished work. Um, and so I titled this of a light that's always been because it, the light is there. It's always been there when the light, when the uh, switch is flipped, it just hasn't been quantified. It hasn't been limited. It just washes out. And I put it into these columns that as you walk by, they just hang, they're not bonded at the corner. So when you walk by, they would open and the, the light in the room would go up or down like on a dimmer switch, depending on how much was still being glowing inside the paper and how much was just being let out to be washed back into the room. And I didn't know that ahead of time. It's just one of those discoveries that happens. Now, <clears throat> this piece, so these are called Tory gates, if you're familiar with this form at all. That top horizontal beam is, the, is representative of heaven and the lower one is representative of earth. Now, a Tory gate will be at the front and back and I have an inch, a lot of interest in Japanese culture being a wood-fired artist um, and, and specifically fire and anagama style kiln. Um, this is where that aesthetic was really grown and not perfected because that would be the wrong word, um, but really matured. And the Torah gate is in front of Shinto shrines, in front of Buddhist temples, 
uh, often in Japanese culture, uh, you're, you're, these, these can be vice versa. You're married in a Buddhist ceremony and buried in a Shinto one or the opposite. Um, and so what it represented to me is that there was no hierarchy between these two different uh, spiritual practices. And so because of that, there must be a degree of flexibility in, within the culture to be accepting. And acceptance is a psychological, emotional practice. It's not something we experience in the physical world. And so a lot of my work from this point forward is trying to take a psychological or emotional experience or an intellectual experience and turning that and making it be a physical experience. How do we physically experience the intellectual contemplation, pursuit, reflection? What does it mean to be reflective in a physical way, not sitting and thinking or sitting and pondering or sitting in wonder? And so I thought about that a lot. And so I took, um, I built this piece here called Between the Dark and the Light. So dark and light are polar opposites. Um, you know, you may have heard the phrase that most everything is gray. Somewhere on the spectrum between polar opposites is where existence really happens or where experience really happens. It's not ever completely this or completely that. Just like a story between two people is not completely their version or not completely their version. It happens somewhere on the grade. And in that kind of distance, in that process, I wanted to have a physical experience that you would have to move your body in order to negotiate the piece. And so this piece has this big sweeping drop in it. But for us, and this piece, like it's a pretty decent sized piece, like 40 some feet long. Um, you can walk in it, so it's about eight feet high or so on the inside and the doorways. But what this piece really is, is about interior space, uh, even though it's an outdoor public sculpture. And as you walk through, there's a thing in the Japanese tea house where the door is lower and narrow. So just one person goes in at a time. And when you open the door to enter, you have to duck your head so you don't hit it because the door's short. Well, they don't have the phrase, well, they might have the phrase ducking your head, uh, but what it is, it's, it's, it, the architecture forces you to bow and lower your head. That's an act of humility, whether you realize it or not. Whether you know that you're supposed to bow going in, you can't get in unless you do. And so architecture has a lot of power over your lived experience. It determines a lot of your lived experience. Um, and so this piece, you had to adjust your body and move down and duck because it got down to about four feet in that low sway and was a little off balance. It's very leaning. And then it centers back up so you can walk back out. Um, I didn't want to like, I could have forced people to crawl out the end, but it wasn't really what I was into. It wasn't more, it was supposed to be a punitive experience, just a, something that you would adjust and then be back to yourself, but you not your same self, you have another experience. Um, and so I took that a little bit further, went back into the interior and started to play with perspective and started to play with codes. And there's a lot of building codes, like there's um, like the doorknobs or the door handle on your entry door to your studio space is determined. It didn't just end up there. There's a code that says it has to be at this height. There's a code that says the doorway has to be this wide. Like you're in a public, relatively public building, your doorways have to be 36 inches wide. Like you can't have a 28 inch doorway in that building. That's against code. Your doorways on the outside of your building probably open out. So when you walk up to it, you have to grab the door right and pull this way towards you. That's so if there's ever a problem inside the building, you can get out and you don't have to step backwards. If there's 20 people behind you and the building's on fire, everyone's got to scoot back one step so you can open the door so you can go outside. Like people are, you're gonna die that way. 
Because if you get pushed against the door, the door won't open. It opens into the space. So there's all these codes for stuff. Stairs have to be a certain height. Uh, railings have to be a certain height, all kinds of stuff. So what I want to do is play with that, with this installation. And so if you can look <clears throat> on the right-hand side, if you think about one point perspective, on the right-hand side is natural vanishing point, is a natural perspective to these two platforms that are leading to this door. And on the left is forced perspective. That side is cut on an angle. So it appears to be following some sort of perspective line. But the actual perspective is the right. And at this time, I'm reading about the architectural uncanny, which is this process of knowing things in the body and things being kind of off. If you've heard of the phrase phenomenological experience, phenomenology is something that you know in the body. Like if you walked across the floor of an old house and the floor's not level and you feel a dip or you kind of leans off to, you, know, you tend to drift to the left or the right, that's not, you feel that in the body, whether you can see it or not. That's a phenomenological experience. Standing very close to a large format painting, like a Jackson Pollock, that's a phenomenal, that has phenomenology to it. That experience does, because it's getting to wrap into your, like you stand very close to something large, it wraps in your peripheral vision. Like we actually don't see things flat if you get close to it, because our eye is not a flat screen, right? It's not like the inside of a camera or a digital SLR. Well, now they're mirrorless, but it's not flat in the back. We're curved. And so the closer you get to something, it actually warps. And you can see it in a lens of a camera if you take a photograph of a doorway. And the door jam will do, will do that in the old lens, because the old lens was similar to the eye. Now you can take straight right up and down, um, but you can do it with your phone. It's like you get close to something and the things will, will bow on the outside. Um, and so this was about seeing, manipulating seeing. Now, has anyone seen the original Willy Wonka with Gene Wilder? Yeah. Do you remember the, the moment in the door where they're going back into the, the uh, workshop and they're walking, they're moving down that hall and that door is only like this big at the end of the hallway. And someone's like, how do you get through that? And he's like, you just gotta believe, you know, they kind of try to get through the door and then suddenly they're through. So that's what this does. That door at the end there is only about five feet high. And it's about this wide, like 18, 19 inches. I found a little closet door and cut it down and made it smaller. So it appeared to be further away than when someone walked up to it, they were like, wow, I'm here already. So I'm playing with perception on purpose. Now, this playing with perception, this idea of moving, uh, building, adjusting the building, making it irregular, right, is really, really prominent in Frank Gehry's work. Frank Gehry's a deconstruct, a deconstructivist architecture um, and deconstruction. This is where I first learned about decon deconstructivist architecture was through Frank Gehry. If you're you might be familiar, this is the Disney concert hall, one of his first ones. Um, you're probably familiar with the Bilbao Museum or the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, Spain. It's a huge running version of these all the way like long along the, the wharf uh, or, or along the port. Um, and Frank Gehry's built all over the world now. Now, deconstructivist architecture is born out of French philosophy, philosophy of Jacques Derrida and it's deconstructivist theory. Deconstructivist theory first started in literature um, that you are finding meaning within the text, within the literature itself is its own meaning. Now, Jack, philosophers write to other philosophers. So if it's something you're interested in, I was advised don't go into the source and read Derrida. Derrida is trying to one up or one other philosophers, right? It's really confusing. You find someone that explains Derrida. That's what you want to read. Like, don't go to the well, just go to the spring. Like, just, it's just, a, it's a lot. Well, one of the things with Derrida in deconstructivist theory is this idea of binary opposition. And binary opposition is, and it's, 
with when it comes to wording is instead of this or that, binary opposition is this and that. And it, if you break down binary and you make down opposition, like binary, they're tied together, but they're opposing things. So instead of dark or light, it's dark and light. It's a really simple little thing, but that's what the you know, is a base element of deconstructivist theory. Now, when it comes to buildings, it looks as if, if you think about this building, it's as if the concert hall, the building itself has been turned inside out. And so all of these parts are jumbled together from its own self, its own building. So they're kind of like a turning in and out and over. Um, and so to understand this more, coming back to like having to be in a physical world, I was like, do I have binary opposition? Very frank question to myself. Frank, that's good. Yeah, um, yeah I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> um, very literal question, there we go. Um, and I thought, yeah, I, I must have binary opposition. I have emotion and I have intellect. How can I understand this intellectual pursuit or this intellectual idea, right? Philosophy, it's all in the head and in a physical way. So I moved to clay and started to work on the ground, making these expressive forms while thinking about binary opposition, building the thing without a plan, but finding form within form, within the forms I was making and then problem solving those forms to a successful thing. Um, and so I was making, I ended up making pieces like this, which is, I'm still working in this way uh getting more complex forms still firing in the wood kiln um this is a piece called farmer um that i named after i found i gave this talk at east la college last january before everything uh closed up and a woman in the crowd uh said afterwards you know do you know the chinese character for farm or farmer i said no i don't i have any idea she goes it's that little plus symbol that you have in the base for your piece. And I had made this piece like eight, nine years ago, I think, something like that. I had no idea. You know, I did the 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 complete like, oh, are you are you serious? Mm -hmm. Oh wow, really? <laughs> like I couldn't, I was in disbelief. She's looking at me like, yeah, yeah, that's why I told you. <laughs> <laughs> and um so this is discover later, but this is part of from um so I build bases for the pieces. Just I want to be really careful not to use white pedestals if I don't have to. Um, because now I have information that's, that adds uh, content to the sculpture instead of just taking the sculpture and putting it on something that we're all supposed to not pay attention to. If you look at some exhibitions, the most prominent largest things in the room or in the space are pedestals. There's be a city of them with a bunch of little things sitting all over the place. And it's like, man, I can't ignore those. You know, as a sculptor, I'm taking in as an installation artist, I'm taking in the whole space, how's it, how it's laid up, where it's at. And so this is just door pine, window screen. That little plus is from a farm door, uh, the bottom cross section of a farm door. Uh, I just took that design, you know, farm door, screen door. Piece like this, I'm pulling title from uh, a piece by Rodin called Count Balzac. Um, this piece has just a sweeping gesture that's similar to that bronze, so originally plaster. And then these table forms um, go back there, uh, a reference to original stone carving. Not original, excuse me, it's ridiculous. Um, long time stone carving tables are on this 10 degree leg that stick out. Uh, they're very, very stable that way. And there's sketches all the way back to Da Vinci's notebooks that have this style table in there. Now, Fast forward from those, I'm back to working in molds, which are what I call these plywood forms, because I'm casting a series um, or an addition, excuse me, not a series. I'm casting an addition. So I did five of these, one of five, two of five, three of five. And then that's the void inside. So I'm building this form, not off of a model, but intuitively and, and analysis. A, a, you know, you have to drift in and out. You have to make some really analytical, you know, formal considerations, and then you have to drift back into intuition 
I think, you know, it, it's good of an artist that can be able to do that. Otherwise you can intuitively work yourself into a disaster or you can intuitively work past a point you should have taken a break. Like has, any, has anyone ever made a piece where 30 minutes ago it was really good? Whether it's a painting or a drawing or a sculpture or something and you overworked it? If you, yeah, if you can't like pull the reins and be like, I should, or really listen to yourself like, I should take a break. And then you're like, no, I'm good. I'm doing so good. I'm just going to keep going. And it's like, yeah, go ahead. It's like being able to really reel yourself in in a moment. Um, and it's a practice. It's because there's plenty of failure that still happens. You know, where I'm like, wow, what was I? I wasn't thinking. That's why it ended up like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so then I'm ram casting that interior space. And then this process is, uh, it's all solid clay. So a uh, fire and I work in solid clay and fire it that way. I just firings go longer and longer. Um, and then I'm slowly peeling these open, torching them to get them out. And then that give you an idea. That's not that form, but a different form um, in the process. Two apertures running through precipice one. And then this is the construction method uh, for precipice two. These both were non reproducible. These are one off pieces. I built the form, uh, had to cut it out with a piece of, with a circular saw, tearing plywood off. It wasn't something that I registered until I could put back together. I'm not sold, I'm not sure what process I'm sold on. Um, and so I'll just keep doing both. Mm. Yeah. And this is that finished piece uh, sitting on a steel base, uh, ziggurat form on the bottom, reference, referencing temple structures. Now, all this kind of heady talking stuff, theory, um, philosophy, right? We're back into thinking about the house as metaphor. Um, and there's a lot of parts in a house that's metaphorical. Um, and so we're working through the loftiness of, of up above. And there's a room in attic truss. And what that looks like is this. Um, it's just space in the attic for your truss. Being a carpenter for a long time, you know, often trusses or always trusses are delivered like this, but often that band will break and there'll be like gesture, Quebec, the front, a Gary reference, like something kind of gesture, movement. You know, uh, I'm prone for making things horizontal and plumb because that's what they needed to be for my career, prior career. That doesn't have a lot of life into it. Um, I did a formal thing and thought about the truss upside down. And then I started to work, I'll sketch in materials um, often over sketching multiple perspectives on a piece of paper in two dimension, because I need to see it. And these are really hard drawings to make or sketches to make. I'll, a lot of work, my sketchbook's mostly words with quick doodles. And then I'm like, I have to go work in, in, uh, um, in materials themselves that are down, I'm working in, in scale. So this is in one twelfth scale. Every inch of this material is a foot in real life. And then I end up making this piece called Attic Frame. Um, and then I had the privilege, I could see this piece indoors and I could see it outdoors. And so I was able to take it out of the gallery and put it uh, outdoors into a public setting, uh, painted it white and you know, pros and cons to both successful in either way and limitations in both. So it was kind of this, it was quite a learning thing for me. Um, and then, you know, what I learned, will I apply it to the next thing or thing down the road? I don't know if it'll be that direct, but it's definitely, it's in there. Now I started to think a lot about how I built pieces and came all the way back to my hands uh, in my studio and thought, could I start with something as simple as this and worked in scale materials again and ended up being, building this piece at Eastern Illinois University uh, called Bauer. Um, and, uh, and then found out later, if you know, familiar with the sculptor, Martin Purrier, he has a title, he has a piece called Bauer that someone pointed out to me. And I thought, well, that's great. I don't mind falling in line with that. He actually was the first, um, was finally invited to do the Venice Biennale, the US Pavilion uh, last year, long overdue. Now for my thesis work, I got this large warehouse. I think I'm running, I'm gonna run over a little bit. 
Yeah. Do we have like 15 minutes? Yeah, class ends at uh, 2.20. 220. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, you didn't want to instruct anything today, did you? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I don't Go from everyone. Yeah. yeah. Keep yeah. going, Scott. Keep going. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, this was a large warehouse space that I got. It was 200 feet long, 40 feet wide, 20 feet tall. And it was like the perfect Stanley Kubrick one point perspective building. And I thought, great, because I have a hard time working with other people around. And when you're working in graduate school, this is going back to grad school, when you're working in grad school, it's a bubble. Um, there's always people around, there's always interruptions, there's always this, and I'm working, used to working by myself. So I needed space to think. So I got this warehouse, built a model version of it in 24th scale. Otherwise it would have been a 200 inch <laughs> box mm -hmm. and started to build these ideas, right? Balsa wood, dowels hanging i did some drawings on on uh i don't know we call it visqueen in michigan in construction even though visqueen is not a word everyone understands what it is here um it's plastic sheeting i, I don't know maybe they call it yeah um but yeah we call it visqueen b-i-z-q-u-e-e-n visqueen i have no idea where this word comes from but that's what we call it here um and so I started to build these ideas because I couldn't work at full scale in there. That's a crazy budget and it's really difficult. and takes a lot of time. And that's the advantage of maquettes. You know, you can work out your idea this big and you just like hold it really close to you and it's 10 feet high. Like you just do that. So this is a, you know, six foot little foam person or six inch person that's six feet tall. And I'm looking at these painted drawings and structure. That's my buddy Lucas who started and we'd used 170 some 200 or 20 foot common trusses in that one end and so this is the portion that we walked under uh, as you came in that's me standing there so if you walk straight through there that's to outside so when you oh when you came in you came in under a roof and walked out through the space underneath the stairs and that has a lot of psychological underpinnings about the space beneath the steps uh there's just a three quarter view to give you an idea. I was using light. So I, I used light to make shadows and then I used shadows as drawing elements. So I thought it was interesting to make a mark by the absence of something, which was a, an interesting pursuit and element to have to, to work with during in this installation. And then that's what you saw when you walked out the end of this from underneath the steps. And this is up into the ceiling and there's an entrance there. You can kind of see it to the left where that front member comes across that you go in. And so you're late. It was about layering up ideas um, when it came to thinking about architectural theory. Uh, at this point, I'm reading about biophilic design, um, which is a guy out of Texas um, about systems architecture. And so this gives you an idea of the scale of walking in and the light angle this is done on a four by five piece of glass so the a photographer grad photographer took this image um is that the light was in your eyes so below your feet was very dark and people would shuffle like very be very careful thinking there was something else coming and it was just manipulating their experience there's nothing it's just wide open floor you could have ran but no one runs in the dark now, if you're thinking about installation work, um, unless you're gonna charge entrance fees, uh, th there's nothing to be made beyond people's experience. So I took some of the small balsa wood trusses and casted these in bronze in investment casting, and then sold these at my show as like maquettes, referencing maquette versions of, of what took place. And it was great. They sold like hotcakes, like awesome. <laughs> because that installation was expensive. Um, now this brings me to the latest installation I did in 2017, yeah, fall of 17. This was the gallery at Linfield College. And this space is known for two things that dominates all the work in the three years I was there, as everyone talks about the height of the gallery and the light. And everything else that's ever been put in there is just owned by those two qualities. 
those two elements. So when it came time for me to do a show, that's where I started my considerations. How do I deny the verticality and how do I manipulate the light? Mostly try to get rid of it. So to give you an idea, there are no lights on in this gallery. Behind me is a window that's eight feet wide that runs the full 20 some feet of the wall. And on the top of the building looks like a lighthouse up there. And that's four sides of glass that just cascades light down into the ceiling or from the ceiling. And this is at like eight o'clock in the morning I'm working. Like you can't, like the gallery is just like, you can't light anything dramatic that's 3D. It's impossible. There's no dramatic shadow. So the doorway also was pretty wide. Um, there's a sliding door and they leave it open and you could pass three, four people at one time. It's like, I, I got to control that experience. And so I built referencing, if you remember back, I talked about the Japanese tea house. And I mentioned about entering into between the dark and the light upright and adjusting and then coming back in is that I built this little door that was maybe five feet high. I think it was a little bit lower than that and really narrow. And the door hand, the doorknob was really low. It's like down, like, you know, usually you just reach, like you can find doorknob in the dark. Um, but this one was really low. People are like, what is going on here? And you could only walk in one at a time. And so from inside the installation was this view. Um, Oh, sorry. And so that's what you entered through. And we're now we're inside the space. So this is what I did with the ceiling. I made, I bought materials for a drop ceiling, acoustical ceiling, put it on a parabolic curve. That far corner is about four feet high or so. Uh, the top, the corner to the left, the high point is maybe at seven and a half. And then the opposite corners are the same. The corner behind me where I'm taking the photo is at four feet. The other corner is at seven and a half. And so you get this twist of the ceiling. This is what the experience was when you entered that space. And often people walked in and were like, wow, like this is the Linfield Gallery? I'm like, yeah, this is it. Like it's get rid of these, rid of these two things. And I had this idea of changing the light and the color and all this stuff. And I was like, this goes back to like, I could have kept adding things but it didn't actually need anything else. Um, we did do an audio loop, which was part of the original design. Um, my friend Lucas came up from UCSD and recorded the space because we wanted, we wanted all the meaning for the installation to stay within the installation. I didn't want people to bring outside. I didn't want to add anything from outside the installation to the inside of the installation, if that makes sense. So I want it to be a self-fulfilling loop um, or self-evident loop. And so what we did is recorded the ambient noise in the space on a high def, uh, microphone for about four hours and then played that through the audio system, the speakers that were up in the ceiling above the drop ceiling and did that and then changed the volume up and down and brought low levels that were out of our audible zone up into where we could hear it and then took some of the highs and brought those down and then put some of the highs right at the very top. And this is all what Lucas is part of the installation. And so as you sat in there, you would hear the ambient noise and we changed the volume. So sometimes it would drop out all the way and you would have the true ambient noise. And then other times you'd notice the volume was really high and you're like, what's playing? But there was no discernible break in the loop. And Lucas and I made sure that you couldn't, like we sat in there knowing that we did the audio and we couldn't find it. I'm like, is that it? He's mm -hmm. like, no, I don't think that's where it's at. So people came in and I'm gonna, this next slide, and maybe it'll load fast enough, but this is walking through the space. It'll load here in a second. Thank you. 
Yeah, it's just a little choppy. Yeah, so that was present tense, and it was referencing at the time um, pretty powerful political atmosphere we live in, and it wasn't really that much less in 2017 either, um, and not wanting to put capitals on it, so purposefully it was under uh, using lowercase. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, so a little bit about some public sculpture. So when I got that big warehouse, I was asked to build a sculpture for the port authority, um, American Central Port, where that warehouse was. And this was one of the initial maquettes, but the site was all vertical, the vertical telephone poles. And the guy who asked me said, oh, I'd like to see the maquette vertical. And he was like, yeah, that's not going to work. And so often you got to pop, you have to, uh, um, you got to teach your clients a little. And so we ended up residing with with blue since it's near the Mississippi River. Um, not that the Mississippi River runs blue ever. <laughs> yeah, the, but we did get to build it in the warehouse space itself, uh, welding up at scale. And then this is that finished piece, Wake of the Flood, titled after the sixth uh, studio album by the Grateful Dead. Between the Dark and the Light is a, is a song lyric from Comes a Time by the Grateful Dead, big fan of theirs. So Wake of the Flood also fit where this piece is located. It looks like an earth levee leading out of the port and along the Mississippi River or any river systems, you often have floods. And you know you get that high water mark where the trees are jammed in and the branches and all that and the water recedes and that tangle is left up there. So that's the wake, what's after of the flood. And blue because of the, the water once again. Um, but these are really big 3D projects. This is another public piece I did for Evansville, Indiana called The Gateway. And it was an opening leading from the general neighborhood to the arts district in Haney's Corner. And they have a lot of to the left here, art festivals and you know art tents put or the tents put up and craft fairs and all of that. Um, and this was also built originally. I'll use the maquette. Um, I built a large, rather large one at like one sixth scale and uh, and then pulled all my measurements and angles off of the maquette. So and once I've built enough maquettes, two, three of the same version, I feel like I've already built the sculpture a number of times. So it helps in sorting it out. Um, this is a more recent piece from All This President's Men uh, referencing the political climate and uh, my position on white male history of politics being barriers uh, to anyone else that's not white and male. And hopefully this is in Kentucky. So if you're familiar with horse fencing at all, they have the four rail fencing everywhere in Kentucky for the horse farms. And hopefully those white barriers are starting to fall down. Um, yeah, this is in Frankfort, Kentucky. This is where, that's the state capital of Kentucky if you're not familiar. Uh, so this is Mitch McConnell land, um, who I'm not a fan of. Um, and then the last like five slides I think here are some maquettes that I've been working on lately. This is more of a, uh, I call it a church. Um, that's a loaded word, but it's a place for ceremony. Um, I'm really interested in a lot in pavilions uh, because they're temporary, they're architectural follies, if you know what a folly is. And they're places of gathering for perf that provide, or there's spaces that provide gathering, performance, reflection, and they're temporary, um, uh, pavilions are. And so I thought about this one a lot in regard to spirit, uh, re religion and spirit, um, where you enter, there's a, you know, saying said you enter and exit life on your own or by yourself or solitary, however you want to word it. 
And so the one entrance is just wide enough for a person to fit through on their own. And the other side is wide enough to a larger group at the same time. And this is kind of like that view from there. Um, but to be self-critical, I'm not sold on the spine line that's created at the top there. Um, it's not refined enough. It's a little haphazard. I'm not really sure how to resolve that yet um, without it being overly like streamlined. So, but I'm able to work in this scale, which is inexpensive and fast. Uh, but I can see that like that line's not going to work in space very well. This piece here is more of like a cathedral. Uh, if you're familiar with the Burning Man Festival at all, these are ideas I have for that. They seem to go maybe not best, but they fit well um, because that there's large structures there and everything built out of wood is burnt at the Burning Man Festival in this kind of cleansing, uh, transformative experience. And so I thought these pieces would go well there. Um, that's like the fast pavilion <laughs> uh, up for eight days and then light it on fire. Um, and you can see these like large trusses again, but trusses built into flat planes and then and then erected so they're supporting each other. You have an idea of the scale. That's that same little six inch uh, foam piece. So that piece is, you know, some 40 feet tall or so. But we'll see. All right, thank you. Thanks, Thanks, uh, covered the range five minutes to go <laughs> questions yeah um, i think maybe i just ran long so i didn't get too many questions that could be it right <laughs> so did people have a question they would like to ask we got uh, about six minutes left I'd like to i have time if you want to stay a little bit later i'm not this is what i'm doing today ah. <laughs> yeah let's have someone ask something from their paper or i'll just start pointing how about maddie you got a question uh, sure um do you have a favorite material to work with um i don't no i must not yeah if i have to think about <laughs> it um i'm you know, material has meaning. And so if the material best serves the meaning, then that's where, you know, that's the one I got to use. Like, I don't like working in resins and fiberglass and those sorts of things, like heavy fume stuff. Yeah, I prefer not to use those. How about another question? The biggest failure that turned out positive. Nice. Oh. Um, geez, I had a, well, I don't know if it was a failure, big learning moment. So the piece, the piece that's up right now, I can talk about this piece that's showing right now, attic frame. I am prone for working by myself, like 99% of the time. And if I need help, I need, I'll ask you for a very specific thing to help me with. And then that's it. So I, this piece is built in sections and I carried each section into the gallery and started to assemble it by myself. And I was propping one thing up and holding that like my body and like trying to screw the thing together and I couldn't hold it. I couldn't do everything by myself. And so it actually cracked, broke and half pinned me to the floor. It's not that heavy. It's just really awkward. So I was able to get out from underneath it yeah. and I went straight down to the sculpture studio and asked my friend Ed if he could help me. And then my sculpture professor Thad was there and one other person and Thad was like, are you okay? Because I mean, we knew each other well. He could see it on my face like, yeah, I just got pinned to the floor by sculpture. Um, <laughs> and, I, and he's like, well, why don't we come give you a hand? I was like, well, I just need one person. And Thad comes down. He's like, Scott, you have to learn to ask for help. Yeah. Good one. Yep. Nice. I got one room for one more question. If people have a burning desire. It could be anything. You don't have to. What made you stop teaching? Oh. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah. 
So I stopped teaching at Linfield because the school was not supporting the job that they hired me for. I was hired to build a sculpture facility and they did not hold up their end of the bargain when it came to supplying, supporting equipment, space renovation, that sort of thing. Citing all sorts of academic administrative buzzword stuff. Um, but I've been in the game long enough in academia to know that you're telling me one thing, but I understand how things work. So you're actually making, making a choice, not you're not actually a victim of these circumstances. You're making a choice to spend in one area and not spend in another. And that didn't line up with what they told me when I got hired to why to when I decided to resign. Yeah, I basically told the, the uh, provost that I didn't trust them and that I didn't wanna be a part of the future of the school because they weren't interested in being in part of the future that they hired me for or having the future that they hired me for. That's that. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> and there's often times where I'm like, what was I thinking, you know? Right. Um, because there's a lot of advantages there, but I'm like, I had to, I've always trusted to make an educated, rational, justified gut decision not based on emotion. So being in the same circumstances over again, I'd be packing right now, just like I was a year ago. Nice. Yeah. 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 Even though- about your dog real quick? Oh yeah. <laughs> Judy, come on. Uh, Judy. 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 Last name is Judy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, she's a rescue. I got her March 29th. Aww. Hey, Judy, come. I might. Might be outside. <laughs> she's, always, she's glued to me. She's probably at the window. No time. That's funny. Um, yeah, I got her March 29th in Oklahoma City. Um, I found her on Pet Finder and then went and picked her up and drove her in my truck for 16 hours the following <laughs> day. And she was one of three things. She was sleeping, looking out the window, or laying in the seat with her head on the armrest of my truck, staring at the side of my head. And I was just like, I'd be driving like, oh, I'm your person. I'm your person. It's okay. <laughs> what kind of dog? What's that? What kind of dog? So she's a third each of German short hair pointer, lab, and pit bull. Yeah. Nice. Uh, yeah. She's a little muscle. Yeah. <laughs> and one of the I fastest dogs I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> she runs and she's this high off the ground. Like, yeah. Uh, and she's a total cuddle pup like crazy but yeah she's a sweetheart well i think that does it for all right class for all. yeah thanks. yeah thanks again scott right. yeah you bet good much right. appreciated you bet have a good semester will do yeah go big yeah yeah when it's out go big <laughs> have you uh did you all hear the do you know the sculpture motto that's yes. awesome. I yeah. do, but you should tell it. Yeah, so these are interchangeable in any three orders. Um, I found out later is that if you can't make it good, make it big. If you can't make it big, make it red. Yeah. And you can go in <laughs> any order with those. I added a third, uh, another one is if, oh, you yeah. can't, if you can't make it red, paint it blue. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, awesome. red, red All right, y'all. Thanks so much. Thanks, Scott. See ya. Take care.